kind of person. They're solving physics problems, engineering problems, uh, power thrust curve problems. Uh, they're not dealing with biology. And as a matter of fact, I think this is one of the definers of our current dilemma. We didn't have to up until this point in time. And now the technology has reached a point where uh, it's not just that we're going to lose a pilot because the plane fails or something, but we're going to lose pilots because they can't operate the systems that are being presented to them. Nowadays, when a fighter pilot climbs into the cockpit of a high-performance jet, he's charged with the awesome responsibility of operating some of the most complex machinery ever devised at speeds that would outstrip a rifle bullet. We believe that the pilot's workplace is perhaps the most demanding office in the world. Not only must the pilot attend to all the information that's presented on, on a myriad of controls and displays, he has to do this while being shot at, pulling G's, worrying about getting killed, or missing something that may be flying in from the ground or from an air, another air threat. Also, he has to be concerned about where his friends are located, because he certainly doesn't want to shoot down one of the friendlies. So we feel that perhaps combining all of these things, that the fighter pilot's role is perhaps the most demanding one that of any job in the world. I see him loud and clear. The speeds have increased, but the problem is that it doesn't have anything to do with the actual speed. It's the relative closure and, and how quick things happen. Uh, in World War II, possibly, we could still see a formation of fighters 20 miles away and uh, traveling at 300 or 400 knots. Uh, we had a good bit of time to think about that. Uh, now, 20 miles away is only uh, 30 seconds before I have to start doing something really important. But from the pilot's point of view, it's the F-15 which is arguably the most complex of them all. Because he alone commands the various engine, navigation, flight control, and weapon systems. For other, less convinced commentators, it's a classic example of an almost religious belief in a technology that is in danger of overwhelming today's fighter pilot. In the F-15 cockpit, for example, there are 300 switches. 75 different displays, 11 switches on the control stick, and 9 switches on the throttle. The horrifyingly short life expectancy of a World War I fighter pilot was a chillingly brief 17 hours in the air. Just three short years before Bob Todd's exploits as World War I started, sporting planes were being... But by its invention, the jet had brought other revolutions. The high-tech 262 was frankly a major headache as far as endurance, maintainability, and reliability were concerned. And for the pilot, the new complexities of jet engine control and management meant that the cockpit was now an unfamiliar nightmare of switches and dials. But there's a saying in fighter aviation that speed is life. And with a top speed of 540 miles per hour, the extra 100 miles an hour that this aircraft gained over its closest prop-driven rivals was too seductive to ignore. I see him loud and clear. But now, in addition to the historical inevitability of close-quarter dogfighting, fighter pilots were coping with a deluge of radar and radio inputs as well as being faced with surface-to-air missiles, SAMs, which would wriggle up from the jungle at over the speed of sound and explode within feet of your aircraft. Even for many experienced pilots, it all became just too much. There were a lot of things going on. Uh, our radar warning equipment was giving us warning that the missiles were being launched against us. We didn't know whether that was true or false. I had... Uh, Intelligence coming from an agency in real time. They were telling me that MiGs were coming up behind us and were going to attack. We had uh, ground control from a carrier out in the uh, Tonkin Gulf telling us where the MiGs were approximately relative to us. We were listening to the people that we were escorting. There were other people that were uh, suppressing the uh, anti-aircraft artillery and the SAMs, all on the same frequency or on various frequencies that we were listening to. Uh, I could hear the growl from my air-to-air -air missiles. The heat seekers uh, have a distinctive sound that you hear in the headset when you have them selected. 
and of course all the noise from the radar warning equipment. As it happened, the MiG came up behind me and my wingman saw him and tried to warn me of the MiG. And I never heard the warning. I saw a missile go by, presumably his first shot with which he missed, and uh, tried to turn out of the way. Good, uh, luckily, I did turn out of the way. The second shot only damaged my airplane slightly and I was able to bring the airplane back. But I never heard my wingman calling me, trying to tell me there was a MiG behind me. When I got back, I listened to the tape of the mission and clear as day, he had told me that the MiG was there and what I should do to avoid the attack. I didn't hear it. I was totally saturated. Despite all the efforts at human engineering uh, to consider all the variables, there's still just too much. And you hear stories about pilots given the option who turn the equipment off and fly by the seat of their pants because they, they're just overloaded. Going in across the Red River in this very old airplane, we had a procedure where we started turning off things like this. Well, it's not here anymore, but there was a, a detection gear for the SAMs. It made noises. It bothered you. It didn't tell you the right information in the first place because if you relied on this, the SAM was going to hit you. You, you avoided SAMs in an entirely different way. You had to see them. Um, this would warn you if one was coming up from behind and then you're, you know, you'd do something different. But we turned that off. We turned off guard channel because there's always somebody screaming on the emergency channel. We turned off the growl on the sidewinders. I'd usually put the kid in the back seat on cold bike so I couldn't hear him. He could hear me. That's what I wanted. See? And I, I turned off all the noise I could to, so that I could then concentrate on the battle at hand. Here's what happens. You have an airplane that's very sophisticated, costs a lot of money. Therefore, you can't build very many of them because we do have a fixed budget. Every year it's fixed. So we say, well, we can, we can procure X number of airplanes. Well, if we can only have that number, then we've got to have the very best money can buy because Americans have always been willing to trade treasure for blood. So we're going to make that a very sophisticated airplane, and we're going to give that guy the capability to do everything. It's going to be able to get all kinds of information, and he's going to be able to do all kinds of things with it. As a result, because we can't have as many airplanes, we have to give it more capability, so he has to do more, the pilot has to do more, and as a result, he gets overloaded and in my opinion, is going to get shot down while he's trying to figure out what he's doing.